Hi. Hello. So I think, Eric, um, we're going to start off by, uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and then we're going to take some questions from the audience. Does that sound good to you? It sounds great. Excellent. So um, this is what I'd like to do. I get asked a lot of the same questions um, over and over by, by people, and um, I'd, I'd like to ask some of them of you just so that I can, you know, get you on record for, uh, so that I can just say, you know, well, but Eric said this so that we all know what the <laughs> official answer is to some of these. Um, so the, the first thing I'd like to talk about is, you know, you and I both talk a lot about getting out and listening to users, talking to users, doing, you know, that early user research to, to find product market fit. Um, so seriously, what's the deal with that? Like, why can't we just ask people what we want or what they want and just build it? Yeah. Um, I get the question uh, pretty regularly. And in fact, I was just, uh, I was just working with an industrial appliance company that makes, you know, physical hardware. So it's totally far from our software roots. And they had uh, gotten into, into a mode using advanced manufacturing and 3D printing uh, of being able to produce a new version of their device every week. So they had a weekly cadence of build, measure, learn, showing a new version of it to actual customers and uh, getting feedback. And they were pretty proud of themselves because, you know, we had, they had gone from like a multi-year development cycle to a you know, multi-day development cycle, which is pretty impressive, especially because in the early days of showing customers what they were working on, customers weren't interested in, in it in the slightest. And so good thing they found that out like in a couple weeks rather than a couple years. And even that team who I was like visiting and they were showing me the factory tour and I got to meet their industrial designer and the you know, person who leads the team, very proud of himself, wanted me to meet the team. He's, he, he's like, hey, I want to open it up for questions in case anyone on the team has any questions. And I swear to God, the industrial designer like <laughs> raised their hand and said, well, if I, you know, why do I have to waste my time like doing this extra work to show my designs to customers when they just tell me what I already knew in the first place? <laughs> the whole team was like groaning because it was like, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. Like, have you learned nothing? But it, so it was just, it's really funny because when people feel that way, there's two things going on at the same time, as you know. The first is um, we, we tend to be overconfident in our ability to deliver something that is going to be delightful to customers. Uh, everybody I meet thinks that their product is the most amazing thing you know, in the world. Uh, and so it can be really scary to say, you know, hey, are you really willing to, you know, I'm sure you're right, of course, but, you know, are you really willing to double check? Just let's just confirm, like, that we're on the right track. You know, just what could it hurt? Since our product's so great, your customers are going to love it. It'll, it'll be very easy to test. That Products like teleportation that everybody wants are the easiest ones to test. That's like the ultimate testable hypothesis. Uh, but the second thing that happens, you're like, well, then how can someone maintain their overconfidence in the face of the fact that, like, in this particular case, I happen to know that the initial customer uh, trials went really poorly. People are able to retroactively change what they used to believe in order to have been right in the first place. So what happens is you, you have a design, and you're like, oh, this design is not perfect. Because has anyone ever seen a perfect design of their own? No, of course. Like, all, you know, art is not done, it's abandoned. Never. It never happens. So you know that your design is imperfect. And then you show it to customers, and they complain, and they don't like it. Then you retroactively decide that the things that you thought were imperfect about it are the same ones that customers thought were imperfect about it, and therefore the test was a waste of time. <laughs> and it's just like it's just a very human thing. But every time I've done this, I'm like, well, let's just write down in advance what you think customers are going to say. And then if you're right, you never have to do a test, customer test ever again. You could just use that and lord it over all your colleagues. You know, if, if anyone actually does it, they're often quite surprised by what they used to believe before the test. And, uh, you know, anyway, so it, it is a, 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 an arrogance problem of epidemic proportions. And I really think the only correct answer is try it, you might like it. Like, you can't, you can't force anyone to do it, but I'm sorry. I, oh, I've, I've tried to force people to do it. Um, did Did anybody ask this guy if you already knew what users wanted? Why didn't you build that to begin with? Well, sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, because that wasn't so funny in the room. It's like, well, yeah. Well, he's like, you know, his recollection, as best as he remembers, is that's what he advocated for. Got it. And it's like, well, and the only reason they didn't build it is because the other people in the room, you know, made him compromise his brilliant design. Well, of course. And it's really funny because, like, this is a case where we have evidence, like the documentary evidence exists that that's not true, and yet the belief still persists. Unless you think uh, I am picking on other people and only on designers here, I mean, I have been guilty of this myself. 
And my favorite time when we when we were um, when I founded uh, the company Inview, where where Laura and I had a chance to work together, I can remember like vividly like it was yesterday the initial meetings that I had with my co-founders about what features were going to be absolutely necessary in the product and which ones we could kind of skip. Like we had a really interesting set of conversations where we kind of sketched out our product and business strategy. We really thought hard about what, you know, what the future of the business was going to be, et cetera. And I remember that conversation I, almost word for word. It's very crystal clear in my memory. And I remember physically writing on a whiteboard you know, these columns of features that we thought were going to be essential. Mm -hmm. And in the way I remember it, I was the one advocating for the stuff that turned out to be right. And my co-founders were the idiots trying to advocate for the wrong thing. I mean, I can remember the debates, and I remember being right about pretty much all the essential elements. But sure. uh, due to a quirk in office moving, this, that whiteboard I was just talking about got lost. Oh. And uh, so I didn't think anything of it at the time. We just bought a new whiteboard and we moved on with our lives. But then we moved offices again like two or three years later. So years into the company, the whiteboard resurfaces. Someone finds it in the attic or wherever it had been lost. And the writing is still on the board from that meeting. And I, I was looking at this thing and I was like, someone has played the ultimate prank on me. Because there it is in my own handwriting, all kinds of things that I know I never believed. No way. <laughs> was I right? Like I remember the columns with the features in them, and like when you look at it, it's all mixed up. Like some of the things that turned out to be exactly critically important are are there, and some things that are like totally wrong are also there. I'm like, who wrote that stuff? Oh wait, that's me. How is that possible? So like it is a very, very, very strong thing that happens where you do once you know the answer, everything becomes mm -hmm. obvious, and you can't remember ever having thought anything different. So if anyone on the call thinks they're immune from this force, they need to get with the program and go experiment a little bit and see if they in fact are, because it's quite rare that people can actually remember what they used to think when they find out the truth. And if you can't fail, like if you always retroactively declare success, then you can't learn. And if you can't learn, then you're really in trouble. That's, that's absolutely a fantastic idea, especially in design, because we often, I often talk about you know, the brilliance of adding analytics and metrics to design is that you actually can get a design feedback loop going where you can become a better designer by using analytics and metrics. But analytics and metrics aren't just, you know, they, a lot of designers complain that, you know, they take the, the sort of the joy and the creativity out of design. I say, no, they just make you a better designer because they tell you whether what you did worked or not. Um, but actually writing it down ahead of time, what you think is going to happen is that's, that's genius because you can't get that feedback loop unless you are honest with yourself about what you expected. You can't become better unless you, uh, you, you know where you went wrong in the first place. It's a very good idea. Oh, totally. Yeah. So um, what are some of the other giant mistakes that you see entrepreneurs making when they're doing, you know, user research or talking to users? Because I, I see the same, you know, like five over and over again. I'm curious if you're seeing the same ones. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure we are. I mean, you know, th there's, it's like whatever, whenever people can latch on to some kind of tactic or like tool and go crazy with it, they just, they do. Uh, so, you know, the most common thing is, you know, that people have the resistance we just talked about, which is, a, I'm so brilliant, you know, I'm the second coming of Steve Jobs, I don't need to talk to any customers, uh, as if that's how Steve Jobs worked anyway. But anyway, you know, exactly. people think that. So you get them over that. And then the next is like, okay, well, if talking to customers is a good idea, then uh, all I have to do is just go ask customers what they want and then write it down and then build that, and I'm guaranteed to be successful. Mm -hmm. So I've I've been in that. I've tried that. Let me tell you exactly how well that works. Uh, and, and it doesn't work for good reason. If you look at the academic research on people's ability to answer hypothetical questions accurately, mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing how overconfident humans are in their own ability to understand what they would do in the future. And, I mean, we're talking, they've done the research in the lab, like, what are you going to eat for lunch tomorrow? People have absolutely no idea. And now you're saying, hey, uh, hypothetically, if I were to build a product, you know, a whiz-bang gizmo with this kind of specification that did this and it solved this problem and it painted your car and, you know, made you live forever, do you think you would want to buy it for this price, like, you know, sometime in the next 18 months? Like, it's a crazy hypothetical. People have no idea of the answer to that question. But unfortunately, they're very happy to answer it. So customers will be very happy to be like, oh, I would never, ever buy that. 
under any circumstances, right. and then you're like, well, you're actually in the process of buying it right now. What's going on? Or, you know, it's like, oh, I would love that. I would buy it in a second. Great. Uh, can I have your credit card? Uh, I can't find my wallet. I'm not sure where it went. Like, the excuses people make all of a sudden. So, the, the you know, and imagine if I was a scientist and I was, like, studying physics or, you know, real science, and I came in, I was like, oh, I'm trying to study physics, but, oh, shoot, electrons don't know what they want, and we can't do a focus group, so I guess I'll give up and go home. You know, you say, well, that, that person is a lunatic. This is the same thing. If we're going to take a more scientific approach to product development, we can't just rely on what people say. We have to test to see how they actually behave. And, Laura, you already said it a second ago. The, to me, the definition of good design is design that changes customer behavior for the better. Mm-hmm. So if something is, is art for art's sake, like that's not, that's not a design. That's just art. Right. Uh, and even so, you're like, well, wait, what's art that has no impact on people, really? Is that so great? So to me, if if we are changing the way people behave, then we're improving the design. And that means that that ultimately design is a science. It, it's something that can be measured. It's something whose impact uh, can be quantified. And that makes a lot of designers uneasy because, you know, we've been taught that art and science are enemies and science is not creative and all kinds of other nonsense. But I think science is one of humanity's most creative pursuits. And if you look at, you know, some of the most creative people that have ever lived, they're scientists. And mm-hmm. what people forget is that science is a, is a process of testing hypotheses to see if they're true. Uh, it's only as good as your hypothesis. So where the hypothesis comes from is a really interesting part. And so I think another way to think about what we're advocating here is uh, where the great design comes from is kind of ineffable you know, and is very creative and is uh, intuitive and can have a lot of messy components to it. But once we've implemented the design, we really ought to be able to measure its impact or something's gone awry. Mm-hmm. Got it. So, uh, so I, I've got a, a bit of a personal question here. What was your biggest mistake when you actually first started talking to users? Started trying to oh. do user research and learn from people. <laughs> that was the worst. <laughs> oh my god. But okay. To be worst. fair, okay. I, guarantee, I guarantee you that you were not the worst. I'm just gonna. I'll just tell you right now. <laughs> okay. Well, let me I'll, let me try to let me try to demonstrate how bad I was at it. I'll, I'll tell you two two funny stories. The first is. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm an engineer by training, so, so I really like came at this from an agile development point of view. You know, performance, um, scalability, code quality, refactoring as like the primary attributes of a good product. And notice mm-hmm. how in agile there's no attribute for customers actually want to use the product. So I never had any scalability problems because uh, we never <laughs> had any customers, and it's easy to make scalable what? solutions with no customers. What? No in problem agile, at all. Start- you just you just declare something to be done and it's done, right? It's like done. the product yeah, manager. You move the you move the story oh, card to the done column and it's done. Says you. It's, You're it's done. Crazy. So, um, so when we would do usability tests, uh, like the very first in-view usability test, we would bring customers into the office and we would give them a chance to use our product. And I won't get into the like our value proposition. Just suffice to say, was not not very good. Uh, it was so bad that customers would decline to participate in the study. So you'd literally have a customer in the room, and you'd say, okay, I want you to use InView to chat with one of your friends. Please, like, pick a name off your AOL instant messaging screen name. This kind of dates us a little bit. And tell them about this great new product called InView. And the customer would say, no, thanks. I'd rather not. And we'd be like, "Uh, I don't think you understand how a usability test works. We're paying you to be here. So you kind of have to do it. Mm-hmm. And I am not kidding. Customers would say, "Well, in that case, you can keep your money." And I'm not going to. I'm not going to do it. Like we couldn't pay people to use our product. It was that bad. And the first time that happened to me, I I swear, I initially was like, "Fire that customer." I looked at my co-founder. I'm like, "You idiot! Where did you find this stupid person who doesn't understand how a usability test works?" Because it's not my fault. Nothing to do with my product. It's the customer's fault. And so then it happened again. It happened again, and then I, I fell back on the ultimate excuse of the last refuge of the engineering scoundrel. Three customers in a row who can't be paid to use our product, and what did I say? Is that a statistically significant sample? Oh, oh I take it back. You are the worst. I am the worst. It's like, it's like, it's yeah. I, just, no, like, I did not want to believe that we had, that I had like all agile and waste-free, you know, with good refactoring and great unit test coverage, built a product that customers didn't want to use. And so that was like part of my getting the religion about, you know, 
uh, what eventually now we you know we call lean startup, but you know, and mm-hmm. and my first reaction was, you know, then to go crazy, being like, okay, if I wasn't right, if my intuition is all wrong, I need to make this more data oriented, and then I did. Um, you know, I went the other direction where I was like, okay, all we have to do is run experiments. So that means split test everything. So no more design, no more thinking about things, just like every day come in, change something, split test it, and see if it makes the numbers go up. And if the numbers go up, boom, it's a good idea. So basically turning product development into like a spreadsheet where you just turn the crank and take all the human element out of it. And uh, I, I talk about this a lot in my book. That is, you know, equally dumb of an idea because – if you're not, if you're testing things that aren't with fidelity to the vision, then you're really wasting your time. And a very, a, like, a great way to go fast is just to run around in circles, you know, with mm-hmm. high acceleration but not actually making any progress. So that also cost me, you know, I don't know how many years of my life uh, going through a phase where that's what I thought. And, and you can see it. Mm-hmm. I see companies that get excited about A-B testing and they just want to optimize their product. But pre-product market fit, we don't have anything to optimize. So when you make – when you're building the wrong product, if, you're, if, not, if your vision doesn't make sense or your strategy is fundamentally flawed, making the product easier to use just makes it easier for customers to realize that they don't want to use it. Mm-hmm. So it's not yeah, a you're, triple you're win-win. It, it's, it's actually a waste of time. So that, well, if I could have those years of my life back, that would be great. That would be great. So, so in other words, you're making a useless, usable product. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Or improving its performance, right? It's like a product that people don't want, but now I've improved its performance and reduced the bug count. And, uh, you know, the early InView was, like, as likely to crash your computer as it was to give you some kind of avatar experience. And, like, yeah. I, I'm the first release, I remember being relieved that the number of crash reports was pretty low. Well, I was no. like, well, at least it didn't crash anybody's computer, but not because the quality was high, but because customers weren't using it. So, of course, it didn't crash the computer. How do you know if you're there? How do you know if you're optimizing something that people don't want? Um, if you use the right, this, I mean, again, people don't really want to hear this answer, but if you use the right metrics, it's completely obvious when this is happening. The okay. reason it's confusing and complicated is people don't want to actually use metrics that make sense from first principles. They just mm-hmm. want to look at aggregates or what we call vanity metrics. So, like, if I just look at total number of customers, and my favorite graph of all time is cumulative registered users, a number that by definition can only go up and to the right. Mm-hmm. You know, when you look at things like that, then you're like, you're like looking at little squiggles and being like, hmm, did the number go up and what caused it? And, hey, what did we release on that day? And uh, are we re-? like, so if you work in the land of vanity metrics, the people on your team, and especially the designers and the engineers, cannot agree amongst themselves whether the current strategy is actually working. So what's hard is like you're living in different realities. Everyone has their own private set of facts. Of course, the facts are always something of the form. The stuff that I'm working on makes the numbers go up, but it's those idiots across the hall that make the numbers go down. Mm -hmm. That's just that selective memory thing kicking in now in a really nasty way. And so it's really challenging. If you use learning metrics and, you know, follow, obviously there's a lot of math to getting this right, but if you look at numbers like um, the percentage of customers each day who come into our product for new that day and purchase our product. So what we would call cohort-based, or in the language of science, time-independent controlled trials. Then it becomes really clear, and I'll give you another story from InView. When we first started advertising InView on the web, in those days you could buy Google AdWords for five cents a click. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I set up, I personally myself, I was the CTO, but also the VP of marketing because there ain't there was nobody else to do it. Mm-hmm. I set up a marketing campaign where our budget, our total budget was $5 a day. That's all we could afford. Mm-hmm. So $5 a day, five cents a click, we could buy 100 clicks a day. And, you know, professional marketers are like, that's a waste of money. Why would you even, who cares about 100 clicks a day? That's nobody. But to me, 100 clicks a day meant 100 human beings every day coming into our product. And so then it's like a very natural question. Of the 100 people who came in today, how many bought? And I kid you not, for six months straight, the answer every single day was one customer purchased. Hmm. So we had a a solid 1% conversion rate every single day for months to the point where I was actually getting paranoid because it was so consistent. I was like, do the people on Wednesday call up the people on Tuesday, like a global conference call, say, hey, everybody, how many of you bought InView? Okay, one. Okay, we got to coordinate who's going to be the one on Wednesday. Like, 
it was so consistent. It was weird. And, you know, eventually what I realized is, no, it's that the product is not improving over this period. Even mm-hmm. though I'm – like, we fixed thousands of bugs during that time. We made major usability improvements. We dramatically improved performance. We added a lot of really awesome features if we do say so ourselves. And yet, when you look at the data this way, if it's 1% conversion at the start and 1% conversion at the end and every day in between, you start to realize, wait a minute, our definition of better is obviously not the same as the customer's definition of better. Mm-hmm. We need to make a change. And now you know, now we have a vocabulary for this. We would say now we have to pivot, a change in strategy without a change in vision. At the mm-hmm. time, you know, this was pre-lean startup, so we didn't have a vocabulary for this. All we could do was argue with each other. About what to do. It's great. And was was that the only metric that you guys were looking at at that point, conversion, or were you looking at some other ones? Were there any others to look at at that point, revenue or retention or anything else? Yeah, we we had a more complicated dashboard. Um, I, I and I and you actually can see those who've read the book will know there's a. I actually managed to get permission to include an actual graph from those days. Uh, in the book, you can see the, the literally the actual numbers that we were looking at every day, and and I can't really recommend it as an especially sophisticated dashboard because now now I think we know better how to do this. But the basic scheme of what we call innovation accounting, which is like how do you account for progress in a highly uncertain situation, is you want to look for leading indicators of the behaviors that you're trying to drive, uh, so that. Even in the days when you have no revenue, no cut, like, you know, if you say, okay, our goal is for people to become addicted to our product and use it every day for a year, well, that's a pretty high bar. So in the days before you are good enough to have achieved that goal, we want to have leading indicators. So we mm-hmm. we had a, a very simple funnel dashboard where we would look at, okay, what percentage of customers registered for the product in the first place, of those, how many downloaded, of those, how many used the product at least one time, how many used the product at least five times, and then how many of those purchase the product. And even on that very basic funnel, you can really see that we are not making progress during this time, even though our gross numbers, our vanity metrics are up and to the right. Mm-hmm. Got it. And when you figure out that you're not doing well, you know, you're, you're not getting your leading indicators up and to the right, you're just getting your vanity metrics up and to the right, what do you, what do you recommend that people do about that? What's the right way to fix that? She uh, asked in a totally leading manner that you should never use in a user research session. Right, right, right. Well, I'm like, uh, you have a – No, totally, Eric. Is the, correct, is the correct thing to do <laughs> – It's like, should I just hit everybody over the head with a, with a trophy and see what happens? No. Uh, yes. This is – it's really interesting. I, so I've you know, now been through this a lot both as an entrepreneur but now increasingly as a coach. And I've worked now with – tons and tons and tons of startups and now startup teams inside big companies and all kinds of people. And I've noticed this pattern, which is that every person who's been through a pivot wishes that they had done it sooner. Mm -hmm. Like what happens is you stubbornly hold out hope that it's going to work. And then, you know, when, when finally you admit that it didn't and you make, you finally make that shift to the new way of thinking, the new way is so much better almost always that you really wish you had done it before. And I think what's going on is the hard thing about deciding to pivot is actually getting everybody on the same page and looking at the same set of facts. Because when you do that, like if you can get aligned about what's happening, it's painfully obvious that it's time to pivot. And usually what happens is privately people have been thinking all along about a new way. Because even in a company that doesn't really believe in user research as a formal methodology, even the most stubborn engineers and designers, like if you're working on a product and you're doing releases on a regular basis, you can't help but, you know, even unconsciously or or accidentally absorb customer opinions about what's going on because it's just not working. So, like, it's very, you you really have to be stubborn to avoid that information. But nobody wants to bring that stuff up because it can be seen as undermining morale, as you know, kind of knocking the team off its current strategy. So once you finally agree as a team, okay, what we're doing is not working. Does anyone have any ideas for what we should try next? I, my experience has been the new ideas come flooding in. Mm-hmm. And the hard part is actually picking amongst all the really good ideas that pop in. And mm-hmm. the nice thing about this framework is if you set up a time, you say, look, on December 15th, 
we're going to have a meeting. We call it the pivot or persevere meeting, where we're going to decide if it's time to pivot or, you know, is our current strategy working? First of all, it postpones all the arguing and debating about the strategy to that date. So, you know, like I used to work in a company once where every day I would come in and I had a coworker who would be like, today I have a new strategy. Our strategy from yesterday sucks. <laughs> and I'd be like, I got that. But every day, the strategy you're telling me about today, tomorrow you're going to think it sucks. So why are we talking about it? You, just wait. Right you probably know who I'm talking about too. Uh, it's like, could we just no. wait? Uh, could we just wait and see if the current strategy works? Like give it a couple weeks at least, and then if it's not working, make a change. So this is a huge, a huge advantage to just admit that we're going to have that meeting on a certain date. But also it says if you have a better idea, you better come to that meeting armed with evidence that your idea is actually a good one. So everyone bring your evidence We'll make an informed decision, and then we'll schedule another meeting. So the best part about a pivot is it's not actually just a new strategy. It's a new strategic hypothesis. It's a statement mm -hmm. that says if we work in this new way, if we change our customer segment, if we change our design, if we change the technology we're using, or you know, if we change our distribution channel, if we zoom in to make our whole product just about this one feature, the theory is our experiments will get more productive after the pivot than they were before. So like a few weeks into the pivot, you can usually immediately tell if, the, if you actually made the right call or not. And if you didn't, guess what? You can do it again. There's, there's no law that says you can't do it again. So, so by, by kind of making that and doing that, having that conversation in an orderly, structured way, it's, it's, a lot, it's just a lot more fun. Got it. So I have one more question for you, and then I think we're going to go to take some questions from the audience. Um, this is a really important one that, that I get asked in various forms a lot. Um, when do we get to stop talking to users? I mean, like, is it when we find product market fit? Like, when, when, when do we get to just stop listening? Uh, if only. Well, actually, so, yeah. so listen, I, should be, I should be clear that, that, that there are actually two schools of thought on this subject. You'll be able to tell from my answer which school of thought I subscribe to. But I, I want to acknowledge that there are two schools of thought. One is that startups exist to do the search, the learning phase and that eventually you transition into a regular company for the execution phase. So there's kind of learning phase, execution phase. In the learning phase, you need to really be talking to customers. You need to really be testing hypotheses and whatever. But once you find the answer, you know, you, people have different debates what the answer is, the product market fit, or there's different terminology for it. But anyway, at some point, you transition to an execution phase where really your primary job is to you know, now execute the model that you have identified during the learning phase. And I see that behavior a lot. And I see it leading to, to some pretty significant dysfunction. So I'm not a subscriber to the learning phase, execution phase model. I much prefer what I call the continuous innovation model. And here's why. Let's say that you have an outstanding design team, I mean really the best that ever lived, and you go out to research a new product, and you really are very, very, very lean, very iterative, very hypothesis-driven. So you do tons of usability tests. You're talking to customers, you're really you're anthropo you know, you're doing the anthropology to really follow them home, learn everything about them. Then you take some product concepts and you test different concepts and you find the best concept. You really refine the design. You get a really beautiful set of wireframes. You prove that those wireframes are the right ones. You then turn those into fully-fledged mock-ups. You build an incredible specification document, and you're like, we have nailed it. This is the product. Now it's time for execution phase. And you take that giant binder – beautiful <laughs> screenshots that you made, and you hand it to an engineer, and you say, listen, you don't have to learn jack. Everything's been learned for you. Just mm -hmm. execute this binder, and we are going to rake in the cash. That's right, and 50, then they ruin it. <laughs> right, 55 minutes later, what's going to happen? The engineer is reading through the binder, and he's like, oh, you know, uh, on page 72, I was trying to write some, I was doing my first line of code, and I was trying to you know, crank up the framework, and I realized, oh, you said that uh, on page 72, the buttons should have rounded corners, but also they should be highly responsive. Uh, but it turns out that in our framework that we use, the technology we use, it's kind of one or the other. We can't do both. So that's a trade-off, an engineering trade-off to be made. Uh, which one do you want me to do? And I've been in a room where this turns nasty. Because mm -hmm. you know, from the design point of view, it's like you, we can't – it's not one or the other. We've determined this is the right answer. You need to make it work. And the engineer is like, well, but physics. So what do you want me to do? Like, 
I understand that you said that it's a requirement, but from my point of view, only the laws of physics are required. So everything else is optional, and this is one where we have to make a trade-off decision. So there's something new to be learned, like within one minute. And so mm-hmm. what, what happens in practice is the poor engineers are told, make it work. They do their best to make the trade-offs, but they weren't in the user research conversations. They don't have any exposure to customers. A lot of companies, the engineers are forbidden by practically by law from talking to the customers. So mm-hmm. they do their best to interpret the spec they were given, given the constraints they're under, of course, time, quality, money, pick two, and all that stuff. The final product looks nothing like the designers thought it would look like. And then now who's responsible for the bad? And, of course, customers don't like it. Now who's mm-hmm. responsible? How do you drive any kind of accountability in this situation? Engineers say, well, it was this horrible spec I was given. And the designers say, well, you didn't implement the spec exactly as I told you to, so how can I be? So that turns into a big mess. Mm-hmm. So I would much rather see a cross-functional team of engineers and designers, but also all the other functions, operations, marketing, product management, business, whoever's got to be part of this, together continuously do all of the phases. So instead of saying we do the design, then we do the implementation, rather than we say, look, we build, measure, learn in a cadence, weekly, quarterly, monthly, whatever it is, but we all go together to make all parts work, and we're constantly revising, constantly learning, constantly improving. So we kind of move out of that phased approach and into a more continuous approach. And with the teams that I've seen do that, Uh, including that team I was mentioning at the top that had the the stubborn designer who was complaining about having to do it. I've never met one of those. Yeah, you know what (laughs) I'm talking about, right? I've never met a stubborn designer in your life. Well, it's always a designer that's stubborn. Engineers are always great. Uh, Yeah, so, you know, like, yeah, people get uncomfortable because it's a very different, confusing new way of working. But the results, you know, the results speak for themselves. This team Mm -hmm. is like – has a probably gone from an almost 0% chance of success to a non-zero, probably pretty high chance of success. Like I'm very proud of what they've accomplished. And it's just from the outside anyway, it's totally obvious that a new way is crushing the old way. Now, it requires everybody inside to get used to it, and it's, that's, I don't want to undersell how difficult it is to do that transition, but, but the results. Well, and on the upside, no designer then ever has to write a 70-page spec, and no engineer ever has to read one, which is – that's always been my least favorite part of the job anyway. It's so a lot that, that's of time. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. Think about, just think about all the dysfunction that the status quo drives. People are always like, well, this new way, it seems confusing. It seems like it's problematic. It has this, I have this concern about it. Concern. It's like, yeah, yeah, I got that. But the status quo is really bad. Mm-hmm. Not only is it incredibly wasteful and expensive and frustrating, it also doesn't work. Like customers don't like the results. So mm-hmm. it's like it's late over budget. And you get a bad outcome. So, like, how much worse can a new way be? Can we at least try it? Yeah. No, I, I had a I had a great conversation once with a CTO um, on exactly this topic, where um, I, I was explaining that we needed to get rid of some, you know, some sort of spec and uh, switch to some other method. And he was like, "But, but how do you account for this?" issue and I said well how do you account for it now he's like oh we can't now like it, it, we don't have a good answer for that either <laughs> I was like well then try mine because mine fixes five other things <laughs> right <laughs> like now at least you don't have to write the spec I mean you know so. anyway those thank you those are all of my questions those are you have literally answered every question that I that I could possibly put to you um or everything <laughs> that I thought so uh, I think we have some questions from audience which will be interesting Great, thank you. And they can't be any of the ones we just asked. <laughs> and we have several questions that have come in. So, folks, we are at Q&A now. We're going to take your questions. Send your question in for Laura and Eric. Open that group chat widget. If you haven't already done so, type it in, send it in, and we'll take as many as we have time for. All right. Laura, here's a question for you from Alvaro. What are the main differences between your book and the one authored by Jeff Gofelf? That's that's an excellent question. Um, So, I, so I know that the titles are quite similar. There is Lean UX and there is UX for Lean Startups. Um, I would say that my book is written more for entrepreneurs, founders, product managers. It's really about helping people in startups, also in larger companies, but um, helping them try to validate hypotheses and um, do just enough user research and design to sort of get them by. I think Lean UX is uh, more about um, it's it's aimed more at actual UX practitioners and and helping existing teams become more lean if that makes sense. So 
Um, I always, I always laugh. There's a, there's a talk I give about design where I, the first slide I inform all of the designers that they're going to be bored out of their minds and I ask them to please leave the room because I think that a lot of the stuff in my book isn't going to be particularly surprising to people who have done UX design for a long time, but it's, I, I hope that it's very helpful for people who don't have a background in UX, don't have a background in user research, um, to help them get far enough along that they can actually get their product out, get an MVP built, understand their users, figure out product market fit, do all that sort of thing, as opposed to, you know, big existing teams and helping them to be leaner and helping them to, um, you know, to, to work better together as cross-functional teams. So I'd say that's the, the major difference. Great. Thank you very much. Um, next question here is for Eric. Um, Eric, can you tell us a bit about your incoming project concerning the Lean Startup movement, maybe a new book, new training program formulas for startups and entrepreneurs? Oh, good Lord. Uh, I'm still trying to deal with the aftermath of the last book, so uh, I think a new book would kill me at this point. Um, you know, it's interesting. I um, I go through phases. I've, I've realized this now, you know, re like only retroactively, but I, I go through phases where I'm I'm writing about things, and then I go through phases where I'm too busy doing things to write about them. I've never been very good. Some people can like write a live blog while they're accomplishing things. And I honestly don't know how that's possible. When I was writing, it was a full-time job for me, and I really couldn't – I had trouble getting anything else done. And now that I'm kind of doing the next set of work, I find it very hard to write about it at the same time. But um, since the book came out, what's been really interesting to me is having the opportunity now to work with a different set of companies that, than, I, than I had worked with before, uh, and really in two categories – one are like really big established companies like GE and Toyota, like like monster uh, existing companies who have gotten really excited about trying to figure out, hey, how do we use Lean Startup to to really re-inject a culture of entrepreneurship back into our company? How do we use it to manage and, and um, support the entrepreneurial part of our innovation portfolio? Uh, and then to get to work with, with high-growth companies that have kind of moved past the MVP, like initial MVP stage, and I've had had some amount of product market fit, and you know, just because of the timeline, there's a bunch of companies who, in the early days of Lean Startup, were really excited about it and, and gave us a lot of like we're you know interested in those initial techniques, and at the time I was trying to talk to them about entrepreneurship as a management toolkit. You know, I've gone around t saying that entrepreneurship is the management discipline that deals with situations of high uncertainty and team structure and accounting and all this stuff, and I got a lot of eye rolling and hand waving. I was like, listen. Thanks very much, but what we really needed some help with MVPs and fast cycle time, but we got it. And now a lot of those same entrepreneurs have become CEOs of pretty big companies where they have a lot of entrepreneurs working for them. And so now their natural intuitive affinity for MVPs runs up against the need to have company procedures. Uh, they, they have people working for them who don't have that same level of entrepreneurial intuition. And so they're seeing their companies kind of do the wrong things. So it's interesting, like what those comp what those guys have in common with the big corporate CEOs that I work with is there's there's a common aspiration that we all have, which is to work at a certain kind of company. We know that the 20th century style managed companies are not they're just not the best. They're not that fun to work at. They are incredibly inefficient at innovation. They're great at supply chain management, but they're not good at being customer-centric. They're not good at user research. There's a bunch of things they're just not good at for structural reasons. So there's a set of, of CEOs that I think share a common vision, which is we want to build companies that achieve sustainable growth through continuous innovation. That's what we really need. And that's actually very exciting because it means that a lot of us have something in common even though our companies look different, even though the scales we operate at are different, we still share that same common vision. So, so can we make a company that's built to learn? Can we, we build a company where a lean startup is baked into the, just the standard operating procedure for when we encounter situations of uncertainty? And can we be the drivers of disruption rather than its victims? So to me, that I think is really interesting theoretical territory. It allows lean startup to expand into a number of industries and sectors where, you know, well, we're far, far afield from our roots in, in software. Uh, and, you know, if I ever manage to come up for air, maybe I'll have the chance to write about it. But at the moment, too busy doing it. Great. Thank you so much. 
Um, next question here is from Ravi. He'd like to know, um, how do you validate and vet early adopters, which forms the crux of two practices, MVP and business measure learn feedback loop? So that's so that's a big question. Actually, can you can you repeat the, the first part of that? How do you validate? Is it sort of how do you validate early adopters? Validate and vet early adopters. Validate and vet early adopters. Okay. So um, this is getting into some fairly specific user research techniques. Um, the first thing that you want to do, uh, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, the first thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that you have a really clear picture in your head of who you think your early adopters are going to be. Um, in the UX world, we often call these personas, although I think um, there's some misinformation about how to actually use personas out there in the world. Um, but the idea is that you want to have a very clear picture of, of who you think these people might be. And then you want to go and talk to them, and you want to listen to them, and you want to understand their lives, and you want to do this early ethnography, this early user research, and you want to really understand their problems and what problems they have that, that you can fix for them. Um, I think often what happens with people, with, with entrepreneurs, when they go out and they start doing this, what they, what they do is they, they go out with an idea, and they start going out, and they find people, and they start pitching their idea and, you know, people go, oh, yeah, that sounds great. And then they get this sort of false sense that they've really understood that, uh, that, their, that their product is a good idea. I think that's a mistake. I think that what you really want to do is you want to focus on, okay, so I have this idea for a product. I think this product's going to be useful to this particular group of people, whatever it is, you know, people who prepare taxes for other people or, you know, moms with three kids who live in the suburbs. Whatever it is, you want to figure that out. You want to go out. You want to look, you want to talk to those people, understand those people, understand what sort of problems they're having, and then figure out if your idea for a product actually solves a serious problem for these people. If it does, if you think that that's true, then you start, you, then you can actually start doing some validation of that. So there's lots of ways to, to validate this. You know, you can do the you know, traditional sort of landing page tests. You can do what I call audience building, which is where you know, you try to actually go out and get a group of these people, you know, who you think are in your persona group to uh, follow you and to, you know, read blogs that you write or, you know, get on an email list for you or to commit to actually giving you money. I mean, honestly, I think Eric would tell you this, the single best way to find out if somebody will buy something that you're selling is to sell it to them. You know, ask for a credit card, say, you know, we're, we're not going to charge you for this, but we have this product. Would you pay me $20 for it? when it comes out in two months. Um, not sorry, not would you pay it then? Will you give me $20 for it now? And, uh, you know, I will give it to you in, in two months. And then you can really start to see whether this group of people that you have picked, this persona group, um, is interested in the product that you're selling to solve the problem that you have identified that they have. Um, so that's a, sort of a lot of different methods mixed into one, but it's it's a very big question. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. Let's see here. Next question is from Dan, who would like to know, can you give some basic examples of how you do UX research with users, um, paper prototypes, click-throughs, just plain talking on Skype? Well, uh, you should read Laura's book because um, <laughs> th there's like more detailed step-by-step uh, -step, like case studies and guides packed into that book than in any other document I've ever seen in my life. Um, <laughs> so that, yeah. that's the real answer to your question. Um, I'll, I'm going to mention one, uh, which is not what you're expecting, but um, you know, Laura can fill in with some more conventional answers because really anything you could possibly want to know about the standard answers to this question, I, I'm not kidding you, is in, is in her book, no joke. Um, I want to talk about the world's most successful Kickstarter campaign. Uh, it, of course, it predates Kickstarter. It was the Apple iPhone. And people are like, okay, the Steve Jobs method of design is you build something fully formed, you don't talk to anybody about it, and then boom, you spring it on the world and they immediately start to buy it. And there's a book coming out about the creation of the iPhone and the battle between Google and, and Apple, and it has a lot of really great behind-the-scenes details about how the Apple iPhone was created. And it really busts a lot of these myths. And it, and it has actually a lot of really good tips for doing this kind of, uh, this kind of research. So um, what Laura was saying is the best way to find out if people want something is to show them a, some version of a concept of it, sometimes just like a, 
a mock-up, a video. Like if you look at most Kickstarter campaigns, it's a video plus some text. And then it says, hey, would you like to pre-order? Give us your credit card. And everyone thinks they know how the iPhone was made. Steve Jobs just said, let there be an iPhone one day. And then, boom, next thing you know, it was in stores and everybody lined up around the block. But at the time that Steve was on stage giving that presentation for the iPhone, uh, how many iPhones had ever been manufactured in the whole world? The answer was zero. They hadn't actually figured out how to manufacture any of them, and they had no supply chain. The actual unit he was using on stage to do the demo that day was uh, one of a couple of handmade prototypes. They were so buggy and crashy that he had five other ones um, under, the de under the podium. That it, The idea was that if it crashed, he could kind of surreptitiously grab another one and start over without anybody noticing. Uh, and my favorite detail is the engineers had worked out through trial and error what they called the golden path, which was the specific set of actions and clicks that you could do on the demo unit that would cause it like, not to crash very often. So Steve's on stage being like, I don't know, I think I'll text somebody, and then I'll you know, do an email, and look, I'm going to make a call. Every tap was strictly scripted because if he deviated from that path in any way whatsoever, the thing would crash and, and he'd have to start over again. So that's how crappy and buggy the early prototype was. And yet people stood in line around the block to buy the iPhone. I mean, it was the ultimate pre-order campaign. They had six months from the time of him doing the presentation to the time to actually have things ready in stores. And luckily, because people were dying to get it and the video was really successful, they knew to anticipate big demand and they could scale up appropriately. You can be sure if nobody had pre-ordered, they wouldn't have bothered to solve all those problems. So, you know, you got to do, you know, you got to be like Steve, but not on the scale that Steve operated at because he's, he was already famous and, you know, a big successful entrepreneur at this time. You're not. I mean, I assume if you have time to listen to this call, you're not. Um, so that's okay. You don't have to do it at, the, at Steve's scale, but you can still use that same technique of try to create just enough of the product experience to get people to, you know, to want to commit to it or not, that you can measure whether you're on the right track. That's, yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. I, I was also going to say, once again, I think that, that the, the question itself, like, is, that's an enormous question that, that you asked. Um, Yes, what Eric said, that is all true. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is there are hun literally hundreds of techniques that you can use in user research to get different kinds of uh, validation, right? There's, I mean, and that's just within sort of the qualitative research realm, the, you know, the asking people questions and, and the doing, doing interviews. And um, so all of those things that you mentioned, uh, with the exception of paper prototypes, which I'm not going to get into, um, all of those things that you mentioned are great. Like they, they will work, right? You can show mock-ups to people. You can, uh, you know, have conversations with them on Skype. You can do usability testing. The trick is, this is the, this is the important thing for you to know when you're asking what kind of user research should I do? And I get this question a lot. Any kind of user research that you do is going to get you a different type of feedback and validation. So I would not do a usability test if what I wanted to know was, will people use this product? I would not do a landing page test if I wanted to know, can people figure out, you know, how to file their taxes with my new product, right? Those are just a couple of examples. I, you know, I wouldn't do a new user research test if what I wanted to know was, why aren't people who have, you know, used the product for a month, staying retained for the, the second month. Those all require different methods of validation. So the answer is you don't have to know every single method of validation. All you need to know is um, how to figure out which one you need, and then you can go and sort of look it up. You're like, you can go, oh, that's a contextual inquiry. Oh, I need to do a contextual inquiry. How do I do that? Well, there's lots of information that turns out on the web about how to do a contextual inquiry. That's not the hard thing. The hard thing is knowing when, you, when on earth you would want to do something called a contextual inquiry. Um, so yes, definitely please read the book. Um, I also have a workshop uh, that helps lead you through this on Luxor, the, the, the new Luxor that's coming out. That's luxr.co. Um, and it specifically addresses this because it's a question that I get all the time, which is sort of, you know, how do I know when to do what kinds of research? Because there's, there's more than just a few. There's, there's a lot. And 
as an entrepreneur, you can't be expected to know every single one of them. That's crazy. Um, I don't know that I've done every single one of them. Um, so, yeah. And also, um, I'm going to, I'll throw this out. I always do this at the end, but I'll throw this out. If you guys have questions about this sort of stuff, you can actually email me. I'm Laura at usersknow.com. You can email me with questions and, um, you know, ask like what kind of research should I do? And I'll try to quickly give you an email answer. Excellent, Laura. Thank you very, very much. And folks, with that, you do have a resource widget in your widget tray on your screen there. So it's a green file folder. In there are lots and lots of good information and details for you, ways to contact Eric and Laura, information about Eric's upcoming conference in December. So you'll want to check that out because lots of the authors from O'Reilly on the Lean Books are speaking at his uh, Lean Startup Conference. So and we've been pushing out details about all that to you. All right, let's keep going here. A couple more questions. This one is from Dee, and Dee would like to know, if we're a solo founder, when should we build a team? Should we focus on customer dev first to get traction? Eric, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, okay, I'm going to give you the formal answer and then the practical answer. The formal answer, according to Lean Startup, is you do whatever you have to do in order to maximize throughput of learning. So if having more people on your team will help you learn what you need to learn faster, then you should do that. And if the time you spend trying to hire and manage those extra people are going to take you away from the learning you need to do, then don't do it. Now, that's it. That's the formal answer. So from that, you should be able to figure out what, what to do. Now, if you're not sure, I'll give you the practical answer, which is don't. It's always easier to hire people later after you have more traction and you know what you're talking about. So like, the, the, and the reason is the things that you're going to learn, I know this sounds crazy, but the things that you're going to learn are going to change your plans. I know it couldn't, that sounds either so obvious or so crazy, depending on where you are. Like people are always like, well, I'm going to learn that customers love my product and then I'm going to hire people, person X, Y, Z. So since I'm going to have to hire people X, Y, Z eventually, why don't I just hire them now? It's like, well, because maybe the thing you'll learn is that the, the experts that you thought you need, you don't need. So, like, um, you know, I was uh, talking to someone, they're like, we need to have a mobile engineer because, you know, mobile is going to be huge for our product. Early customer conversations reveal customers wouldn't use their product on mobile. It's actually going to have to be desktop web, even though that's so, it's not considered a best practice, and it can't, can't be mobile first. Well, aren't you glad you didn't hire a mobile developer because the first thing you would have had to do is either fire them and ask them to start working on the, you know, on the desktop web. Uh, so that's that's the practical answer. Now, if you insist on not taking my advice and you say I'm going to hire people anyway, I'll give you a second backup plan. So plan A, don't hire. Plan B, if you're going to hire, don't hire specialists who are really good at something you think you're going to need them to do. Really try hard to hire people you think are generalists, are very adaptable, who can change as the learning uh, progresses. And there's a really easy way to find out if someone is a specialist or not. You just ask them one of my favorite interview questions. You just say, uh, tell me about a best practice that you've used effectively in your career. And almost everybody will start to lecture you about something that they think is oh, you always should do, whatever it is. And you say, great, thank you for that lecture. I, I didn't know any of that before. Tell me a situation where using that be best practice would be harmful or not a good idea. Not a good idea. And some people will say, that's a dumb question. Uh, the best practice means it's always best. And then you can say, thank you for your time, and let them walk right out. And some people have the self-awareness to say, you know, this tool is really useful in this situation. So if that situation didn't exist, maybe you'd want to use a different tool. And that's the kind of person you want to hire early on. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eric. Let's see here. Question now from Philip, and this one is for you, Eric. Is a steady 1% payment conversion rate necessary um, as an indication that things aren't working. 1% of an exponentially growing number of users is also an exponentially growing number. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, thank you for that question. I love it. Uh, great. So, so uh, Philip, right? Is that that's his name? Yes, Philip. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to talk about accounting now. And if you don't like it and you find it boring and you want to kill yourself, it's Philip's fault. Okay, everybody? Not my fault. I, I didn't bring this up, but Philip asked. Okay. Here's the thing. If you want to know if – like this used to drive me nuts as an entrepreneur. Come to our board meeting with a bunch of numbers, 1% conversion, 
uh, 25% referral rate, uh, AdWords click-through rates of whatever. And we all we wanted to know really as entrepreneurs is are we doing good or bad? Like wh what's the benchmark? Is this are these numbers good or are they bad? And you know some people would say, wow, one percent conversion of an exponentially growing number is a, that's a big number too. You're doing great. Other people would say, well, I heard that Facebook has a twenty percent conversion or they have a hundred percent retention every day. And I I heard, I heard, I heard. It drove me nuts. So here's the thing: there is no benchmark and there's no standard except whatever you put in your business plan. So I happen to be, the, I think, the very last person in the startup world who's pro-business plan. Uh, not the pros part of the business plan, which is a waste of time. You know, I have a big trend now towards, like, writing down all your beliefs about your strategy and your business model and stuff. I don't know. That all seems like a waste of time to me. To me, the part of the business plan that I think is super valuable is the spreadsheet in Appendix B. Everyone ever had to make one of those spreadsheets where you show, here is my theory about how customer behaviors are going to aggregate into a macroeconomic outcome that's really exciting. And so that growth that is modeled in the spreadsheet is super valuable, not because the outputs are very accurate. It's not very good as a forecasting tool. But it's very good for understanding what inputs, what customer behaviors are necessary in order for my business to be viable. So as the caller, you know, as Philip pointed out, if I have a strategy to achieve exponential growth without needing much revenue to do it, then a relatively low payment conversion rate might work, in which case my critical uh, inputs that I want to be looking at are things like viral coefficient. That's what we call the viral engine of growth. There's uh, another exponential growth curve called the sticky engine of growth for products like World of Warcraft that are addictive, that have really high retention rates. eBay's in this category. Network effects businesses are tended to be in this category where because the retention rate is super high, the word of mouth compounds and you get compounding interest type effects. And then there are businesses in what we call the paid engine of growth, where we're going to take the revenue we make from customers and reinvest in customer acquisition. And so we call them engines of growth because literally one turn of the engine powers the next one, like an internal combustion engine. And in order to figure out which of those three engines you're in, you need a, you need a spreadsheet that shows how it's supposed to work. That's what's in your business plan. And then you need to test the assumptions that make up that spreadsheet to see if they're really working as you saw fit. So if you're a Facebook and you plan to use the viral engine of growth, then your uh, accountability standards should all be about viral coefficient. And how much money you make per customer is actually irrelevant. It doesn't affect the amount of growth you have, and therefore it's a number you shouldn't even look at at all. And everyone thinks that's obvious today, but it really wasn't obvious in the early days of Facebook. It was so non-obvious they made a movie about the argument between the two co-founders about whether they should be focused on charging money or not in the early days. And everyone now is like, ah, oh, Eduardo Saverin's an idiot, and you know, I certainly wouldn't have been like him, but ask yourself, would you have been? It's not always obvious. Sometimes revenue is a really important metric, and sometimes it's not. So in order to answer that, you need an accounting framework. I call it innovation accounting that helps you figure out which metrics really matter. And the key is that all the metrics, when you add them up together, yield a thriving business that grows through sustainable growth. So what's sustainable growth? Uh, there's a current trend in the startup world to just say that startups are growth. That's really all that matters. They exist to achieve growth. And I think that's right, but the problem is that that framework treats all kinds of growth as equally good. Like the growth you get from a TechCrunch article is the same as growth you get through a viral coefficient. And I think that's actually really wrong. So to me, sustainable growth is growth where each new customer comes from the action of a past customer. That's what makes it sustainable. So uh, press hits, publicity stunts, Super Bowl ads, all that stuff is non-sustainable by definition. Uh, and so you want to really focus in on one of those three engines of growth as a way of optimizing the way in which new customers affect, you know, are driven by the actions of past customers. So anyway, that is your deep dive into accounting. I will stop now. If you didn't like it, blame Philip. <laughs> Excellent, Eric. Thank you so, so much. We still have many, many questions coming in. Eric, Laura, would you like to keep continuing on? I'm, I'm, I'm game with Laura. Is. I'm sure. All right. Let's take our next question here from Jenny, who would like to know, Laura, can you talk about research on users before you build a product for them? Yes. Yes. So I, I split user research um, 
up into two different areas. I split it up into a lot of different areas, but, but two of the, the common ones are there's user research and there's usability research. So what you're talking about is you're talking about user research. You're talking about understanding the user. This is what I was talking about before, that ethnography, that understanding users' problems. Um, I think that the goal of this research is that the, the other two ways that I like to think of research are generative and evaluative, which are big, complicated, horrible words for something that, you know, generates ideas and something that evaluates whether or not those ideas were, were correct. So this is very much generative research. It's really understanding your market. It's understanding the human beings who are going, who you think are going to be using the product. And often it's understanding whether or not those human beings are the right human beings to use your product, or if there are things about your idea that are wrong. So again, I love doing this generative user research before like the idea for the product has really gelled, before I start thinking in terms of screens or flows or, or you know, features or how something's going to work. I like sort of thinking about the problem that I want to solve. Um, the the example that I used in a in a recent blog post was um, there's there's a difference between um, these two visions for a product, right? So there's there's vision A, which is um, pets cost too much to own, and uh, I want to make something that makes things cheaper, that makes it cheaper for people to, to own pets. So that's one sort of vision for a product. You can imagine that. You could imagine going out talking to pet owners and understanding more about pet owners and, and uh, you know, understanding their problems and what their current behaviors are, right? That, that makes sense. Then there's this other sort of vision for a product that I think a lot of people sort of have, which is um, pets cost too much to own, and I want to make it cheaper for people to own pets by making it possible for people to get jobs for their pets. Um, so that, that, and what's going to happen is we're going to have this job board for pets. It's going to be called Jobs for Pets. And um, people are going to go there and they're going to post jobs. And then I'm going to go there and I'm going to try to get a job for like my dog or my cat or my rabbit. Um, and I'm going to do that by, uh, it's going to, there's going to be a mobile app, of course, because, you know, mobile first. And um, people are going to be able to like track where their pets go. Anyway, as you can see, the second design, thing is, <laughs> what's that? Is it going to be responsive design? Oh, of course it'll be responsive design. Okay, good. Obviously. Okay. Yeah, and a, and a Pinterest style layout, Eric. Come on. I mean, what do you take me for? I'm sorry. So, it goes without saying, I thought. <laughs> I'm sorry. And it should have, really. Um, so, but, so here's jobs for pets, right? And the difference between these two visions for my product, right, is that the second one is just clearly delusional. It is absolutely, completely, 100% insane. But a lot of people kind of come at this with this like, okay, well, we're just going to assume that, that, you know, pets are too expensive and we're going to assume that uh, the way to fix this is with this crazy idea that we're going to get jobs for our pets. And then they just go on from there and start designing and building and mock-ups and blah, blah, blah. And that's, again, how you get this, like, really, you could make a really usable, really useless jobs board for pets. That would be really, you, you can't actually make jobs for pets.com because I own that domain, but you could, but you could, you know, make a, a different one. Um, you shouldn't, to be clear. So the idea of this user research before you have a product is fabulous because it helps you do things like validate whether or not your original assumption that people are worried about how much they spend on their pets, whether or that not that's even true. Because if that's not true, then this whole jobs for pets thing is even more nonsensical than, than you think it is, which I didn't think was possible. Um, so again, it's that user that early user research helps you to validate your ideas and your concepts before you get in and start validating specific things about your product, specific features, specific usability issues, you know, where buttons go. That stuff's incredibly important as well, but it, it, it comes after you already know that you already have an idea that you're building the right thing. You know, and I'll actually uh, let me. I just want to. I, I first of all totally endorse and agree with everything that Laura just said. I do want to stick up for one thing though, which is occasionally you hear people talk about almost derisively that someone has a technology in search of a problem. Yeah. Um, and I actually want to stick up for that. Sometimes the situation that you're in when you get into a startup situation is you're like, huh, I've had some kind of weird technical breakthrough, and I have this thing called the internet or 3D printing or you know, autonomous drones, and like, 
I actually don't really know what this is good for, but I kind of feel like it ought to be good for something. And that's actually a perfectly valid place to start. Like not every entrepreneur starts with the grand vision. In fact, a lot of them start with, oh, this is neat. I wonder what could happen. But the key is if you're in that situation, you have to take the technology searching for a problem thing seriously and actually mm-hmm. search for a problem. Like instead of just working on tinkering on your thing and making it better, you have to go find a customer who has a problem that your thing can actually solve. And the problem, the difficulty with that, and I'm not trying to use the word problem again, the difficulty mm-hmm. is oftentimes the thing that your technology is good for is not the thing you thought it would be good for. So like a lot of the original inventors of the web were like really not picturing Amazon.com and Pinterest and Facebook. In fact, some of them are horrified that's what the technology was used for. But that's the thing with technological change. You know, It's fundamentally driven by the solutions that it enables. So you've got to go figure out, okay, I've got this crazy thing. What's it actually good for today? And then you've got to use all these user research techniques to try to evaluate a bunch of different bunch of different scenarios. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that 100%. I, um, I, I would say that, that there is a difference between um, a tech, not like a new technology and a product idea. And maybe that's just being semantic. Um, no, because I 100%, yeah, I 100%, I 100% agree with you that, that, um, you know, you can have a technology that can have, that's really mind blowingly different and, and really changes the world. I don't, I would say that 95% of the companies, at least that I talk to, that's not the case. Um, so, if you think oh, that's yeah, the no case, excuse. your company, no right? Excuse yeah, like with a product idea and just wedded to it, yeah. it's like shame on you. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I but I, I actually, I love the idea of having like a really interesting new technology and something that's really a breakthrough. And but then you really, yeah, then that ethnography is really important because then what you're doing is you're coming up with hypotheses for, well, maybe we could use it to help this kind of person in this sort of way. And then you go out, you know, you talk to those people and you find out if that's something that. that would work or you know if they have the problem that you think they have but then you're really you're identifying problems that could be solved with your technology you got it exactly it's really cool excellent thank you both so very very much lots more questions here and we'll take the next one from mike in an ideal scenario in a well-funded brand new startup what's the ideal team composition for a lean startup entrepreneurial team how many people and with what traits to keep the continuous lean cycle running? Well, I got a problem with this question, which is you said it was both well-funded and also an ideal condition. Just start. <laughs> and that is incorrect. Uh, it, I mean, it, you know, there are the occasional startups that succeed by being extremely well-funded, uh, but it's, it's uh, pretty unusual. Usually too much funding at the beginning causes teams to work in too large of a batch size, have too much pressure, prematurely commit to a direction and explode. So, just a word of caution baked into the question. But, of course, that's not really what you want to know. What you really want to know is who should you, who should you hire to put together a, a team. And once again, I can give you the formally correct answer and then a more useful answer. The formal answer is you need to have a dedicated, autonomous, cross-functional team with a stake in the outcome. So let me break it down. Uh, autonomous, you know, just pretty easy to achieve. But too much funding can actually reduce your autonomy. So you've got to have whoever's on the team, you have to have the freedom to fail and to screw stuff up and to learn. And so we have to really make sure those elements are present. Of course, when we're in in an existing company situation, gaining a a political commitment to have that autonomy is quite complicated, so it's important. Dedicated means the core people who are really going to drive the learning have to be on this full time. It has to be their number one priority, the thing that they eat, sleep, drink, think about in the shower. So, you know part-timeism is a curse here. Cross-functional means no organizational silos, so you don't have the engineer sitting in their cave doing their thing and then throwing specs over the wall to a designer. But it also means you want to have every function that's necessary to get the product to market represented on the team from the beginning. So depending on what kind of thing it is, you know, for your typical mobile app, it really can be an engineer and a designer, and that's really all you need. Um, but for a lot of other startups, it's, quite, it's more complicated than that. You need business skills. You need product management skills. You need design skills. You need operational skills, legal skills, uh, finance skills, QA. I mean, you know, like whatever it is, you've got to have people in those roles. But that's at odds with the feeling of having a stake in the outcome because if you have a 25-person committee working on your product, 
nobody really feels bought in to it at the very beginning. It's too big. So if you're going to have a three, you know, three to five person team, which is the size I really like, you know, that's kind of my favorite size. You're going to have to have people who double up in roles. That's just going to be how it is. And I mentioned early on, I played the role of the VP of marketing, even though I didn't know a thing about marketing as an engineer because there was nobody to do it and it had to get done and, and needed to happen. And the great thing about really forcing yourself to wear multiple hats and take those hats seriously is that when it comes time to hire somebody to do that job, you know something about it. So when I started InView, I knew nothing about marketing. I didn't really understand what the word marketing meant. But having sucked at marketing for many months, it was a lot easier to hire someone with marketing skills because I had a lot of very specific questions I wanted to ask. It was like, okay, when you're in this situation, how, did you, how do you solve that? And a lot of the marketing people I talked to turned out to be bozos who didn't know. You know, They were like marketing manager strategist people in some big company. They'd never actually done any marketing in their life. Uh, but they were able to accumulate all kinds of success and fancy titles because that's how big companies work sometimes. You know, you can politic your way and all kinds of stuff. And other people I could talk to, and they were like, oh, that problem? That's easy. You should have done X, Y, Z. And I'm like, that took me months to figure out. How did you know that? They're like, well, if you just hired me in the first place, you wouldn't have had to waste those months. And I'm like, I like this guy. Right? That, they're like, okay, now we're speaking a common language. Now we're working on problems that make sense to me, et cetera. So that's, that's my answer. Thank you very, very much, Eric, for that. Let's see here. Oh, several people are asking, Eric, can you repeat what was your very favorite interview question? My very favorite interview question is, uh, tell me about a best practice that you've used effectively in your career. Let the person lecture you about something they really know well. So, like, um, my favorite one is, okay, you're, you're interviewing someone who, like, their previous job was uh, – senior technical architect at fancy big company X. So like major resume, person who really understands software architecture. And, and guess what? When you interview a software architecture and you ask them for one best practice that's really important, they always say the same thing. The most important thing is to make sure that you define the architecture up front. The person who defines the architecture is really smart, you know, parentheses like me. And then you put that person in charge and you do what they say. Okay, whatever. Whatever the lecture is, you accept it graciously and say thank you very much for asking and you know, for telling me all about that. I really learned a lot. Now, uh, my follow-up question is, tell me a situation where that best practice is actually harmful or not appropriate. And most people, will, their heads will explode. I mean, like I've met with a lot of serious architects that are like, it is always, always appropriate to put the architect in charge and do what he says. It is always appropriate to hire the smartest architect you can find. And anyone who answers that way, I immediately say this interview is over. Thanks for coming in. I mean, I don't. I try to be polite about it. But to me, that's the worst answer you can give. The right answer to the question is either – some people are like, well, I've never thought about it before. But now that you mention it, I guess if you were in a situation that was really chaotic and you didn't know in advance what the right architecture was, maybe you'd want to use a different practice. Or someone might say, you know, uh, there might be times when being the smartest person in the room is a bit of a liability because you have a tendency to overthink things, over-engineer things. My favorite answer is um, I've been in that situation once before where I myself had to violate my own best practice, realizing it wasn't appropriate. So if you go on my blog, you can, I have like an acronym I had to make up to, so that I could remember all the key elements of what I'm looking for in an interview because my memory is not very good. I think it's spelled A, B, C, D, E, F, or something like that. A, the first one, stands for agility, which is really my most prized quality. How, how much can someone handle uncertainty? How much can they change domains? How much can they apply what they've learned in one situation to a different situation? And this, to me, is the interview question that, uh, that really susses that out. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Eric. Very, very thank you there. All right, another question here. This one is for you, Laura, and it's from Carla. Carla would like to know, how can you evaluate if a redesign is the pivot and if it is worth the change, if it's the same content, same task, but different shiny layout? Can, can you repeat that one? Sorry, how can, you, how can you evaluate if a redesign is the pivot? Yes, is the pivot, if it is worth the change. Same content, same tasks, but a different shiny layout. 
Oh, got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay, so um, I would say that a, redes- a visual redesign, a visual reskin of something is not a pivot. That, that's just a visual redesign of something. You're just putting a new skin on it, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly. I think, um, you know, a, a pivot is actually more, more of a change than that. Um, so a visual redesign is not a pivot. A visual redesign is just a, a visual redesign. The way that you test to see if a visual redesign was worth the effort um, is by doing an A-B test of the visual, re, the visually redesigned product against the old product. Um, and you have to define up front what that means, what, what better is right, what the metric is that you want to move. And it should be one that's important to you, right? It shouldn't just be it's prettier. Like, we know that it's, or, you know, we think that it's prettier, right? Like, we wouldn't have done a visual redesign if we didn't think that it was going to be prettier. We wouldn't have uh, like that. We need to figure out, like, what, and, and hopefully, honestly, we've done this before we've done the visual redesign at all. We've said, we believe that if we do a visual redesign of the site, that we will, um, move this particular metric, whatever it is. You know, it's not always revenue, but sometimes it's revenue, right? You know, we think that we're actually going to make more money because this is prettier and, and shinier and, and easier to use maybe and, you know, nicer and all these kinds of wonderful things that you get from a visual redesign. Um, and then you actually need to measure that when you're done. Um, now, is are there ways to test that before you do a complete visual redesign? Sure. Um, you can do partial visual redesigns of parts of your product and see if that actually moves the needle as well. But basically, you, what you need to do is you need to actually make some visual changes, get them out into the world, see if they're making the difference that you think that they are. My experience with visual redesigns has that, I, that I've seen other people do. I don't, I don't do visual redesigns personally because I'm not good at them. But... Um, my experience with those has been that they often do not deliver the kind of ROI that you expect, um, that they tend to be done because designers don't like to have ugly things out in the world um, and that they often don't deliver as much money or revenue back as, as, as you would want or as, as that they cost you to do. That said, you should test it and find out if that's true. But the way that you do that, I think, is to, to A-B test Eric, do you have any other good suggestions for this sort of thing? No, you, you, you nailed it. it. If you don't A-B test, I can guarantee your website will get prettier over time if you have designers yeah. working for you and they have a chance to, to be in charge of, of what gets put out. Um, but if you do A-B test, your, your site, your product will get more effective over time. And you have to decide as a matter of you know business values, what do you want? And uh, if you don't care about effectiveness and you just want something to get prettier, uh, I think you should work in a museum. Yeah, no, and museum specifically is is good. I was I was laughing about the the art um, thing, you know, that the design. If you're if you're not considering, you know, things like revenue and things that that that's just art. But I've never met an artist who didn't actually want to sell their stuff. So I mean, even art has to please the end user. <laughs> No, museums maybe not. Maybe, maybe museums are the right way to go. That's the right. Now we're now we're getting into truly philosophical territory. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Then you. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did you say you wanted to be an unsuccessful artist? Okay, great. No, you're 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 all over that. Best of luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you both very much for that. All right, folks. As time starts ticking down here, we're going to take just a few more questions. Uh, this one is from Juan, and Juan would like to know. How can we find good startup advisors that actually focus on profit instead of abstract or philanthropic things? That focus on what, I'm sorry? Uh, let's see here. That will focus on profit instead of abstract or philanthropic things or people who um, want to be disruptive. This is tricky. Uh, I've been really lucky in my life to have had some amazing uh, advisors and mentors along the way, uh, some of whom are, are famous, like Steve Blank, you know, most of you will know, and other of whom, you know, have really stayed out of the limelight, but have been I- incredibly powerful in, in my life and, and giving me opportunities to do things that I wouldn't otherwise have gotten to do. And I've also had some really terrible startup advisors who have given me some of the worst advice uh, I can possibly imagine. And if I'm being really honest, at the time I was getting the advice and working with the advisor, 
I always thought they were brilliant. So it's actually really difficult as an entrepreneur to try to figure out whose advice is actually really useful and who's helping you and who really is just pontificating a bunch of a bunch of crap. Um, and I, I include myself in that category. You know, so some people find my advice really helpful, and I think others, you know, basically don't. And the key is to find someone who you feel like is really helping you accomplish what you have as a goal. And to me, the indicators of that are someone who listens extremely well, someone who actually understands what's going on with your situation, uh, and then can give advice that is actually tailored to your circumstance versus someone who's constantly giving the same advice over and over again. And, uh, you know, people who hear me speak publicly know I have a reputation for saying the same thing over and over again because I'm often trying to evangelize this very specific set of behaviors. But the people that I've worked with as an advisor, you know, in their boardroom, uh, I think would tell a pretty different story. I, people are often surprised when they come to me for advice. They expect that I will give them the stock answer to Lean Startup. But I feel like if people just wanted that, they could just read the book, and it's a lot less expensive than dragging me into their office. So I really try hard to, to make sure that what I'm saying, the advice that I give, is really custom tailor-made to the situation the person finds themselves in. So I'm much more likely, I think, Statistically speaking, I have given far more people advice on the fact that their vision sucks than that they need to do more A-B testing. You know, if you kind of count up the, the times and people who came to me for advice and I start telling them, listen, you have no vision, they get pretty upset because they're like, I came to you because you're supposed to be the testing quantitative guy. Why are we talking about vision? And I'm like, listen, did you even read the book? Part one is called vision. Your science is only as good as your hypothesis, and if you have no vision, this whole thing is a waste of time. But, uh, you know, not everyone is expecting to hear that. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Michael would like to know, Eric, how do you influence stakeholders, senior stakeholders, who are resistant to change and backing new ideas and innovations? Um, Eric, I told you we get the buy-in question. <laughs> I knew it. We were joking about this ahead of time. And, and, I, and I, we resolved that the answer we were going to give is, I'm really sorry to hear that you're an indentured servant. I thought that that was <laughs> legal these days, but apparently it still exists, and, and you can't you can't leave. You're stuck there. So I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, if you're an indentured servant, I don't think there's a lot you can do about it because you have to work there. And so anything you do to disrupt the status quo, to advocate for something different, uh, has the possibility to make people mad at you. And since you have to work there, you can't afford to have them working there. But for everybody who's not an indentured servant, it's actually relatively straightforward. And the way uh, – this took me a long time to learn. I act, we act like it's so simple, but I, early in my career, I was terrible at this. Uh, you know, I really wanted to be seen as doing a good job. You know, it's a legacy of having done well in school. So when people would tell me, listen, you need to do X, Y, Z in order to do a good job, I would try to find a way to combine what they were asking me to do with what I thought was right. And if what I thought was right was diametrically opposed, I would kind of meet them in the middle somewhere and wind up with this mishmash plan that made no sense. And then when the plan didn't work, they would say – you know, you didn't do a good job, this plan didn't work, and I'd say, but it was exactly what you told me to. And they're like, but I don't care about that. Why didn't you get anything done? So actually, to me, the way to get stakeholder buy-in is to say to yourself, what do I really believe as a matter of core values are the right way to get things done? What, what, what do I want to stand for inside this company? And I, early on in my career, made a decision. I was going to stand for customer centricity, rapid iteration, and scientific decision-making. So that even if I got fired, people who fired me and everybody who was in the room at the time would know that's what I stood for. And there were a lot of situations where I came pretty close to getting fired. I mean, in the early days of InView especially, where I was really trying to push the envelope to work in this way, uh, a lot of people are, are excited today about Lean Startup and think, you know, and are, would like, like to brag about how they were part of it way back when, and they always thought it was a good idea. But I remember the actual reaction that real human beings had to these ideas at the time. They were not always that positive. And there were a lot of close calls. But I was satisfied that, you know, at least I stood up for what I thought was right. And listen, it worked out pretty well for me, as you can, as you can tell. So now the people who have trying to convince stakeholders to do this now have a lot more tools at their disposal than Laura and I had way back in the day. Uh, because there's this whole movement and there's a whole vocabulary and there's all these examples and case studies and just tons of evidence that this new way of working is, is just straight up better than the old way of working. So the question is, you know, can you go to a stakeholder and say, listen, 
This is what I stand for. If you don't want to work this way, you know, fire me. It's okay. Uh, if you are skeptical that this new way is going to work, that's fine. Let's run an experiment. Why don't you give me an opportunity to prove to you that it works? And if it works, then we can do a little bit more. And if it doesn't work, you can find somebody else who's more appropriate for this job. I found that to be an amazing uh, deal offered to senior leadership. You're basically saying, I'll accept accountability for the results, and all I need in exchange is these very minimal set of resources and this very basic set of permissions. But if you're going to do that, you really have to have thought through the rules of the deal. So like, I'll give you an example. I was working with an innovation team inside an established company that were trying to get permission to work in a lean startup way. And they were getting frustrated because an unrelated division of the company was meddling in their business. Classic thing. They wanted permission to go talk to customers about a new product, and the existing sales team wouldn't help them. They were blocking them. And so you know, he said, listen, what we want for this team is permission to talk to customers on their own. So just let's see what happens if they go on their own. And, of course, the team was like, well, we also want to be able to go talk to those sales guys and use their leads. And I was like, uh, 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 that's not fair. If you want to be autonomous and independent, you don't get to gank the customer, co company's resources that they're currently using to make the current quarter. That's not fair. If you're going to be independent, be independent. Generate your own customer leads. So it really is about setting up for yourself as the internal entrepreneur to say, I want to work in this way. I want to be held accountable for results, and I'm prepared to set the rules up in a fair way where the experiment is valid. If it's a weird hybrid compromise between the new way and the old way, no one will believe in the outcome. So you've got to be a true experiment. But I've been amazed. I have dealt with some extremely cranky, ornery, old-fashioned leaders who, when presented with the opportunity to run the experiment, are like, well, why the hell not? Let's go find out. And that, to me, uh, is, be is better than 100 books that you give as Christmas presents and better than 1,000 PowerPoint presentations and 10,000 experts coming in and telling people what to do. Yeah, I, I just want to say I 100% agree with that. I I think the, the the answer to this is, you know, as Eric points out, bring data, right? You you don't change people's minds by just getting up there and saying, but I want to try this, you know, try it, try it and bring data. Um, the other thing that I'll say, and when I when I laughed about the buy-in question, I, I, I literally get this question specifically from user research people uh, a lot. And since, you know, we're talking about user research earlier, I want to bring this up. People say, you know, well, but I, you know, I'm a user researcher and I want to convince, you know, my company that user research is important. And, you know, they don't, they don't see the value in what I do. And literally my answer to them used to just be, you should quit and you should find a job at a place where they respect what you do because there's lots of them. Um, sometimes I would vary it and say, oh, you should flip over a table and storm out. Um, but that was really the, the idea. But what I've come around to is that, that a lot of people really do want to make these changes from within. And, and, and I support that. Um, I would say that the other thing that you can do specifically in the, the user research uh, realm, make the people who are in charge of making the decisions Make them experience what the customer is experiencing. Make them watch videos. Make them talk to customers. Do your research, bring your data, but make sure that it's all recorded and that they have to experience this. Because I think a lot of times people who are making decisions, um, especially at large companies, are, are so divorced from what the actual end user experience of their product is that they're making these very theoretical decisions, but they're not based in, you know, really what the product does or how people are using it or what they're forcing users to experience during it. So if you can make them experience that, if you can get them to watch users, if you can get them to, you know, watch video clips, if you can get them to, you know, actually look at the data and say, you know, like we had this hypothesis, this was the test that we ran, you know, here are some, here's, exactly what happened, you know, experiences with me, they're much more likely to, um, to change their minds and to realize that, that you might be onto something. Um, I would say that if you do all of that, if you make them watch video, if you show them the data and they're still resistant, that's when you quit because you will not change their minds. They are not fixable. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes I would say be open to the idea that certain company cultures might not be fixable by you 
And that's okay. There are lots of companies out there that are or that, that are already working this way and that, that desperately want people who, who can do the things that you do. Excellent, Eric and Laura. Thank you so, so much. Folks, that is all the time we have for questions today. And as we close out the program, um, we've got Eric right now on the screen, um, the Lean Startup Conference slide. If you want to take a moment and just let folks know about it, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the Lean Startup Conference we do every year this year. It is December 9th, 10th, and 11th in San Francisco. Um, you know, we like to think of it as advanced topics in entrepreneurship. So, we, you know, we do have some big-name speakers like Reid Hoffman and Mark Andreessen who will be there um, and, and a few surprise guests who, who will be excited to talk more about, a lot of hot companies too. But to me, what I think is really cool is you be an opportunity to hear from practicing entrepreneurs, engineers, designers, people in the trenches dealing with Lean Startup who you haven't necessarily heard of and you wouldn't hear any other place. So this is not just experts and gurus talking theory. This is 100% practitioners talking about what is actually working and not working for them. Uh, it is in San Francisco. starts December 9th. If you're from out of town and want to come in, we have a whole week of events, so you can you can spend six or seven days in San Francisco uh, learning a lot, or you can just come for the main conference, which is Monday and Tuesday. Uh, if you want to learn more, it is leanstartup.co. And if you go on my blog, Startup Lessons Learned, we've been doing interviews with a bunch of the speakers, so you can kind of get a flavor for the kind of information you will hear uh, if you come. Thank you so much. And folks, we pushed out links to the Lean Startup um, website so you can get more information about the conference there. Laura is going to be speaking at that conference as well as lots of O'Reilly Lean authors. So please do read about that and check it out. And boy, oh boy, it just, it's an incredible opportunity, and we hope that you will be able to attend it. We would also like to let you know that we did push out in your group chat, so if you didn't open it, please do. It's a code to save you some money today as a thank you for attending the webcast. It's a code to save you on Laura's book, UX for Lean Startups. So if you like what you heard today, please, we invite you to take a look at that book. There's so much in there that can really help you with your day-to-day, -day, so I hope you take advantage of that. Also, in that lovely resource widget you have, that green file folder, lots of links to lots of good information. Laura's blog is there, users know, Eric's blog as well, and also links to the O'Reilly Programming blog where Laura has posted many posts. So we hope you take advantage of all that. Eric and Laura, thank you so much for spending so much time with us today and for taking so many audience questions. We greatly, greatly appreciate your time. Thanks for having us. Folks that attended today, we thank you for attending. And based on all the comments that you were posting in the group chat, you really did benefit from today and enjoyed it. So we were thankful <laughs> that you were Thanks, having such a good time. <laughs> yep, lots of good comments here. So thank you, folks. This will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everybody. Take care. <laughs>